through 11. So I went to the angel and said to him, give me the little book. And he said to me, take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Okay, should be working now. Hooray, praise the Lord. Thank you. We're, we're good, I, I think. Yeah, I think. Praise the Lord for really fast tech support. All right, well, today we have a message about where should we be? You know, as, as we're getting close to the commencement of all things, you don't want to have that feeling. You ever, you ever been in the wrong place at the wrong time? You get to feeling like, I shouldn't be here. You ever been there before? I've been there too. Um, I don't want to be there again. So the Lord wouldn't have us be in, in that situation either. And he especially wouldn't have us be in that situation pertaining to salvation and where we should be in his church. He has uh, many places in the Bible to speak on this. And one of the most powerful ones is in Revelation chapter 10. We're going to look at that today. And so that we can do it well, we're going to pray. So let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can trust in your guidance. Not just ask and hope but we can trust in your guidance. So, Lord, we do claim your promise to guide us with your eye this morning. We do claim your promise to send us your comfort or your Holy Spirit, which leads and guides us into all truth. In Christ's name, amen. Turning your Bibles to Revelation chapter 10. There'll be some pretty amazing things coming out of Revelation chapter 10. You can see an illustration of what John sees in vision up on the screen there. Revelation chapter 10 starts with verse 1, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, 
clothed with a cloud and a rainbow upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Now this is no ordinary angel. The angel here, uh, and the Bible uses the word angel also to represent messenger, not necessarily just a created being as an angel. When we look at the description of the way that this is described here in Exodus 16, 11, it says, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Here in verse 1, it says that he's clothed with a cloud. And also, we see in other parts of Revelation that about the throne of God is a what? Is a rainbow. Here in verse 1, we also see that this angel has a rainbow upon his head. And his face was, as it were, the sun. We can study this out where we find other references in Scripture where Christ's face is described as as bright as the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. So, this angel is none other than Christ. We continue reading in verse 2, And he had in his hand a little book, open. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. Now the earth is composed of two things, earth and sea, land and sea, right? And so if you have your feet on something, when the Bible uses the word having your foot on something, especially using the phrase having the foot on your neck of your enemies, right? You have Christ portrayed here as having his feet standing in a position of power and authority over all the earth, over land and sea. He's bought it back by his blood. He created it in the first place, and now he's showing that he will soon come as the dominant king of all creation. In fact, there is no other king. Verse 3, And he cried with a loud voice, and as when a lion roars. Now, Jess and I went to uh, Camp Kalakwa recently, and when we went to bed... I, after we went to bed, I heard some, some very loud roaring. And I turned and said, Jess, I'm pretty sure there's a lion somewhere on this campus. I haven't seen him. I haven't heard anything about him. But there's a lion here. I can tell. And you don't have to be very close to a lion to be able to hear him, to know he's there. And sure enough, we were able to go and see this lion and uh, ever so often, he claims his territory. He roams around, and then he roars. And that lion is saying, this is my place, this is my kingdom, this is my dominion. Now, where else does the Bible mention a lion in the book of Revelation? In Revelation chapter 5, and verse 5, it's talking about finding one who is worthy to do what? The same thing that we're doing here in Revelation chapter 10. The same one who is worthy to open the book. So that's what's going on here in Revelation 5. And we'll start in verse 4. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. We know that's none other than Christ Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's opening a book in Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation chapter 10, he's opening a book again. The Bible's very consistent. Verse 4 now. And when the seven thunders... Oh, verse 3. And cried with a loud voice, and as when a lion roars, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now if we look in other places in Scripture, we see in Matthew 26, 64... Well, not that verse... Now, 
when Christ is, is, uh, is meeting with the Pharisees and uh, he's praying, he's saying, Lord, glorify me as the, with the glory I had in the beginning with you. The Father speaks from heaven. I believe this is John chapter 12. And he says, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And it says, some thought an angel had spoke and some thought that it was thunder. We see here that we hear thunders from heaven here, just like we did when Christ prayed. And so what's interesting is that what is John doing here in verse 4? He's actually writing the book of Revelation, right? Because as he's re receiving these revelations from God, he is writing it in the book of Revelation. So if he's writing the book of Revelation... What book can it not be that the little or that the angel is holding the little book of? It can't be the book of Revelation. It's got to be another book of prophecy. When the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, "Seal up those things which is, which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not." And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand. To heaven. Now, this is the position that you take when you're doing what? You're taking an oath. And verse 6, And swear by him that lives forever and ever, who created heaven, and the things that are therein, and the earth, and the things that are therein, and the sea, and the things that are therein, that there should be time no longer. Now, what is time in the Bible? We know it's not the revolving of the earth on its, a, on its axis, creating the time of days and weeks. Instead, biblical time is prophetic time. Biblical time is when Christ says what is going to come, what is going to take place in a prophecy, and that's biblical time. So, when there should be time no longer, that would be nothing other than the culmination of of the longest time prophecy in the Bible, the 2300 days spoken of in Daniel. Daniel is now revealed to be the other book of prophecy. The other book that the little or that the little book that the angel is holding and he's holding it what? Open. Open signifying that it can be read, that it can be understood. The longest time prophecy in the book of Daniel of the 2300 days goes to 18 and 44. What was happening around the time of 1844? The message, as we see here, we can even zoom in, judgment begins on that day. For the judgment to begin, it must mean that Christ has already made a way so that those who are to be judged can be found righteous in him. And we see that also in the time prophecy, that Christ came just on time at the end of the 70 weeks. Christ is cut off from among his people, made a sacrifice as a lamb for our sins. Now we're at the end of the 2300 days, and we see the, the book of Daniel is open. Now, what Christ says happens. His word has the creative power to cause it to happen. His word has that creative ability. However, there is another student of the Bible. In fact, this student of the Bible quoted scripture to Jesus, but he quoted it to Jesus in a deceptive way, tempting him into sin, right? The adversary is also not ignorant of the Bible and the scripture, nor its prophecies. So, right here at 1844, could we expect to find something created to trip up God's people? Something created to make another belief system? I wonder if we could look back in history at what else was going on in 1844, if perhaps there were some other major belief systems designed and created.
Karl Marx and Frederick, Frederick Engels in 1844. When did, they, when did they write that? 1844? You have here the Manifesto of the Communist Party, written at that time. Now, some may think that that has come and gone, but it is still a major influential work in our world today. The social justice, uh, various movements of our day have their philosophical roots in this book right here. They're still very much influencing the minds of men today. You know, the adversary, he's, uh, <clears throat> he's smart in that he will make different deceptions so that people of different tastes and personalities who are attracted to different things, he'll have a system for each one of those. If you are inclined to think that, uh, that man is going to save himself, well, he's got, he's got a system for that. Or if you've got a system to think that perhaps by our science and by our reasoning capabilities, we could figure out truth. So the theory of evolution was started in two, two essays written in 1842 and 1844. Actually, you'll find that day in the introduction in the book, On the Origin of Species. But there are many who are not content to just leave it to physical and material matters for their meaning of life. There are those who that believe in the supernatural. And right about the same time, spiritualism. The Fox sisters, and who wrote this book? Arthur Conan Doyle. He was kind of a nobody, right? He doesn't have any popular movies in our day. You know, Hollywood has found great success in exploiting men's appetite for spiritualism. It's in nearly every TV show you want to look at. This had its major explosion of popularity right about the time of the mid-1800s. 18, This one isn't quite as popular in the United States, um, but when I went to India, it's very popular over there, and I did have a, I've had some friends that were into this, the Baha'i. It also started in 1844. It's a belief system essentially that all the various religions can all be blended together into one, and they're all just not really against each other, but you can just put them together in a buffet and they'll all meet the humankind's needs, that they're all gonna lead you to truth. That had to start in 1844. And at the same time, the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith believed that he received these, uh, this revelation from God about another uh, set of disciples in North America having to do with the Native American Indians. Notice that we're moving from secular to things that are going to be more appealing to a more Bible-based, Judeo-Christian mindset, right? It's not just things that are blatantly against the Bible, such as evolution and Darwinism. But now we have the Jehovah's Witnesses, 1870, formed by Charles Taze Russell. They have their own scripture, which is Similar to the Bible, but some things are changed in it. This one I was a little bit uh, intrigued about, uh, the YMCA. Also started in 1851. A little bit of a... Uh, blending together of all the different branches of Christianity into one and leaving out important truths that the Bible has. Kind of an ecumenical movement. Also has uh, men of secret societies that created this organization. Now, as we think about what Christ's work is for his church in the last time, 
we know that it's medical missionary work is there to complete the picture. As in, like, if the gospel really is powerful of God unto salvation, it will also be powerful where the Christians will be helping their friends, the Christians will be helping their enemies, the Christians will be those who are of most service to the world. Could there also be an imposter for that? You know, you don't make a, a counterfeit $3 bill because no one's going to accept it. But you also don't make a counterfeit $1 bill. Why? Because it's a waste of your time. The counterfeits, they're going to be found more successful than you would think. The social gospel. A liberation movement in American Protestantism prominent in the late 19th century, that's the 1800s, that sought to apply Christian principles to a variety of social problems engendered by industrialization. Its founders and leaders included these men listed. You know, this is a very popular gospel here today. That we can just blend Christianity into politics, combine the two, and we'll come up with some type of uh, utopia that's going to solve our problems. Christ has a special plan for his church in which we are to be helping those that are either less fortunate or injured or, well off, or not as well off, those that have come into catastrophes, disasters. Right in 1847, I don't know if that's large enough for you to read it, but this society was found all around the world, the Red Cross and the Red Crescent. The philosophy being that Mankind is able to help ourselves. Now, helping, helping our fellow neighbor with or without the name of Christ is good, right? This is a, a good thing to do. But notice that it was started by a Freemason. And it was started with the idea that mankind is going to help his fellow neighbor, but without God, without the gospel specifically. And so we wonder here, does God have an actual system or does he just have individual atoms spread kind of all around the world doing their own thing? Or does he have a unified, organized, structured system? Let's continue reading in Revelation chapter 10. We're now in verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. The mystery of God should be finished. What is the mystery of God? Colossians chapter 2 references the mystery of God. Colossians uh, 1, 26, even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among you, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What does Christ in you look like? Christ in you looks like the character of Christ represented in his saints, the character of Christ represented in those who love him. what does it say in verse 7 is happening at this point in time that the mystery of God should be finished? Revelation 10, 7. As he has declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which stands upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Now that's interesting. 
What would be sweet in your mouth, but belly, bitter in your belly? Sweet would be you come to read it, you come to appreciate it, you come to understand it. Was the message of Noah sweet and bitter? It was sweet because there was salvation for any and all who wanted it and accepted it. But was it also very bitter? It was a very bitter experience. Think about when he came out of the ark and saw the earth for the first time. Knowing that everyone that he knew that didn't get on the ark and what their fate was. It's enough to tempt a person to think, maybe I'm, maybe I'm off. Maybe I'm part of the wrong system. Who's this? Was this a bitter experience? This is the bitterest of experiences. Thrown by your own brothers, by your own family, into a pit. Sold as a slave. And as far as he knew, they never wanted to see him again. He never knew that they were repenting. For many years. For many years as he was in a dungeon. For many years as he was serving as a slave to Potiphar. Even when he was arose into position in Egypt, he still didn't know. Until the day his brothers came. What was the last thing that his brothers said to him? Here comes that dreamer. What did they especially despise about their brother? He was their dad's favorite. He had the gift of prophecy. He had the gift of prophecy. That was their specified reason when they saw him, they said, here comes that dreamer. They had no regard for the gift of prophecy. God had also prophesied that his people would come into the promised land. Caleb and Joshua, this is them carrying the grapes back. They have good things on their mind. They're like, we're going to bring these grapes back. We're going to tell them that we're going to go take the promised land. It's right over there. It's not very far. We're going to be in there really soon. We're going to have houses. We're going to have lands. I've got a future with my wife and children. We're going to have a farm. It's going to be great. We're the people that God has chosen. And they came back to give their good report. And in the midst of their good report, how many of their brethren said, no. We're like grasshoppers. You know, they had a very bitter experience because they did their job. They brought back the good report. They bore the truth. And their brothers that went with them said, no, we can't do it. How long did they have to wait in the wilderness for God's promise to be fulfilled? A long time. A long time. David being anointed in front of his brothers. That day maybe wasn't particularly bitter. However, when he went to go join his brothers on an errand from his dad's authority, they said, who are you, who are you to come out here? And who have you left those sheep with? You've come out here to see the battle. You have no legitimate purpose or reason to be here. Tell dad thank you for the food on your way. We know the evil of your heart. That's a rather bitter experience. Who might this be? Did the leadership of God's church have a very rough relationship with those that would bring God's messages? such as that Babylon is going to come and take you if you don't submit to Babylon. This is Jeremiah in the pit. You know, the king actually believed him, but he didn't have the courage to do 
what God was telling him to do. Did that lead to a bitter experience for Jeremiah? Did it lead to a bitter experience for the nation and for the king? You know, I used to have a really uh, challenging time when I'd think about, you know, William Miller and, the, and, hey, Jesus is coming back soon, and the prophecy of Daniel 8, 14, and under 2,300 days in the sanctuary, be cleansed, be cleansed. And I was like, man, what a disappointing thing for them to think that Jesus is coming back. Why wouldn't he help them understand what it actually meant? I had a challenge with that. And then I had to look at God's people in the Bible as a whole and think about some of the bitter experiences that they went through. It actually would be rather inconsistent if they didn't have a bitter experience in 1844, if we look at all the bitter experiences that Christ's people went through. Did Christ himself have a bitter experience? Who's that standing outside with his head turned? That's Peter. You know, Jesus isn't looking at him with a look of disdain. He's looking at him with the pain of losing a friend. Your best friend. So in verse 10, it says, I had eat, As soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. There are today many who have an, a bitter experience in the church. And the bitter experience will lead us to think, I've been done wrong, been treated wrong, or maybe this other thing, it was really bitter for even other people, maybe not me. Or I see the things that are going wrong in the church and it tempts me to think, maybe this isn't the right place. Maybe this isn't the right system of worship to be in. Do you think that that temptation was, was presented to Christ as well? <clears throat> that maybe his mission to his church was a foolish mission? Do you think that the adversary ever tempted him like that? You know, there is a bitter experience that we should shun. This is Saul and Samuel. Saul is in the midst of a bitter experience. Did it have to be this way? No, it didn't have to be this way. At any point in time, Saul could say, I'm going to own up. I shouldn't have done these things. I shouldn't offer the sacrifice. Samuel, I'm going to repent before God and the people, claim ownership of my wrongs and of my sins. But he wouldn't do it. And so Samuel had to bear the message of the, of the Lord to him and said, the kingdom has departed from you. The Lord spare us that we would never have to hear from the messenger of God that the kingdom of God has departed from us. Here in Revelation 10, we see Christ opened the book of Daniel. It was understood that Christ's coming was imminent, that the time of judgment was coming. We see that it identifies not just any particular church or not just any church, but a specific church is going to go through this bitter experience of having understood Daniel, of having understood the proper Protestant historical interpretation of prophecy, the historicist viewpoint. You know, someone called, uh, called recently and said, hey, you guys have the right interpretation of prophecy. This is an evangelical person. And he's like, I'm speaking specifically about the historicist viewpoint. Do you know what I'm talking about? And we were able to say, yes, sir, we do. The same as Calvin and Zwingli and Huss and Jerome and Martin Luther and all of those 
that had the correct understanding. Revelation 10 speaks specifically about that group of people. Now, I have, I have a specific question for the group, and here's the thing, right? It won't be too long before we're tempted on these levels. We know that when Jesus said in his sermon that he was the bread of life, and you had to drink his blood to be saved, it said that many turned away at that time. and said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? For them, that was a bitter experience because his teachings weren't received by the, by the multitudes. And that was too bitter for them to bear, and so they walked away. But the twelve disciples stayed. And so the, that same, tem, same temptation is going to come to us. Where problems, offenses are going to arise, maybe the name of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is going to be put down in the mud. And those that believe in the tenets of faith of the Bible are going to be mocked and ridiculed. And that'll be a bitter experience. But we have the promise of God. And we have it specifically. In the book of John. I'm actually going to read uh, Matthew 16, 18. Matthew 16, 18 says, Jesus is speaking here with Peter. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now did Jesus say I will build my churches? No, I said, I'll build my church. Singular, one. John 10, 16 is the other verse. John 10, 16. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. So there's sheep everywhere, and other folds, but how many folds are there? It's one fold. How many shepherds are there? You know, God is very consistent. And we have to ask the question how many systems is God operating? It's operating one system. How many systems of salvation was he operating in Noah's day? One. How many arcs were there? It was one. How many forms of acceptable worship were there in Cain and Abel's day? How many Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's patriarch system was there? There was one. How many sanctuaries on earth in which to worship? There's one. How many high priests? There's one. How many chosen nations? And there's one. So how many churches did Christ establish? There's one. There's one church. Christ is very consistent. He says, I the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Christ has made things very simple for us. He knows that the plan of salvation is hard enough for us as it is because of our sinful nature. Therefore, he, he makes everything simple and easy. Noah preached a very simple message. Repent. Salvation is on the ark. Get on the ark, and you're all good. Salvation in Jesus Christ's name. No other another. No other name. Believe on Jesus Christ's name. Do not leave the faith but rather be grounded and established in the faith. I 
See, personally, I left the church for a, quite a long time. And it wasn't a matter of even the church has offended me or the church had done me wrong, because that really never happened at all. The church has treated me very well my whole life, as a matter of fact. But I thought that the world has something else to offer, and so I went into the world for many years. And when I came back at the age of 28, it wasn't a question of what system did God want me to join? What church should I be in? Because it's right here in Revelation 10. The church that went through the bitter experience of understanding the book of Daniel and coming through that bitter experience, having the correct historicist view of biblical prophecy, it's all true. And we are to be settled in the faith. And since then, the Lord has been faithful to establish even a a ruffian like me in his faith. What kind of church would God run and operate? We see again, God's consistent. God made a very orderly, organized system the Old Testament, and you see that all the way through the Bible, too. You see that all the camps had their designated places to establish their camp around the sanctuary. They all had their leaders in place. They all had their times of actually when to set up camp and when to break camp, when they would move. It was a well-orchestrated thing, such that when the other nations saw them do just the simple things of setting up camp and breaking camp, they're like, these people have, have it right. We're doomed just by watching them set up camp and break camp. The Pathfinders have that going on, right? If they don't, it's okay. They're children. They'll get there, right? They have adults for that. The adventures are getting there, too. We see in the New Testament also, God had order and established uh, authority in his New Testament church. Why does he need that? It's really simple. If you're going to accomplish the greatest thing on earth that has ever been accomplished, the greatest thing that ever needs done, and you're looking at it on the screen, the gospel shared in three angels' messages, including the everlasting gospel, which includes leave Babylon and join the one system of true worship. Amen? How many systems of true worship are there? There is one. One Lord, one faith, one hope, one baptism, one God over all. One spirit. In order to accomplish that, an organized, structured church is a necessity. God has blessed us so that we don't have to wonder, we don't have to have a thing where we reinvent the wheel of God's church every so often, right? We don't have to do that. God established the system, and we can just be happy and abide in it. We don't have to create some other thing and invite people, hey, come out. There's no remnant from a remnant. Think about it. When Caleb and Joshua said, we can take the land, and they were faithful, and the children of Israel apostatized, did Caleb and Joshua get to go in the land by themselves? No, they didn't. They had to go there together as a unit and as a group. And that's how it's going to be for us. The Lord is going to work in us where we do have this revival and reformation, where we do enter the promised land together in his one system. If today, Revelation 10 has shown you the system that you should be in to see a show of hands as we bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are yours and we are the sheep of your pasture. Lord, guide us into your complete truth 
that we don't need to wonder, we don't need to wander either. Thank you, Lord, that there is no confusion in Christ's church, in the true bride of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join us in our closing hymn, which is all the way my Savior leads me. Hymn number 516 is our closing hymn. If you'll stand with me. All the way. Hymn number 516. you do lead us all the way. Thank you, Lord, that we don't need to wander. We have the blessing of the Good Shepherd, which guides us into the fold and into your service. In Christ's name, amen.